film. Um, and uh, the old man said to me, okay, well, get yourself into university. I said, no, I'm not going to study in Chile. So he looked at me with disgust and said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going off to study farming. But he said, but why farming? We've got nothing to do with farming. I said, I always liked it. So I went off and I got myself off to New Zealand. And I went to New Zealand and I studied in New Zealand and lived in New Zealand and worked for the best part of seven years. In that process of Chile, uh, Chile went through the uh, center left government and then it took an extreme left. And that is where Mr. Salvador Allende came into power. And he was, took power in 1970. And what happened with land, he, he decided that it was going to be expropriate land and there's an agrarian reform took place. And it was all hell broke loose in Chile for 1970 to 1973, the 11th of September of 1973. And what happened in that period there? Farming was destroyed totally because that it was in large owners, large tracts of land, the farms. And this extreme left, a Maduro type far, uh, uh, ideology, decided that this was no good and that uh, land could not be in the hands of less people and it had to be expropriated and taken away. Okay, so that was done and the work people came onto the land, they chucked you out of your house, they confiscated everything you had and you had to get the hell out of the country or get the hell out of your land or your, or your farm. It was as simple as that. I've got a brother-in-law down in the deep south of Chile, which my sister and brother-in-law and three children were locked up in their house and they were picketed that morning. They woke up and they were picketed there and they said to him, get the hell out of here. And he said, well, well what the hell? Get out. It's either that or we're going to torch your house. And he had to leave with what he had in a, in a bag, in a suitcase, and he took off and started farming in Argentine. So that was what was happening. The economy in Chile in that sense took on one hell of an inflation and we were running at an inflation of 3% per day, per day. So it was exactly the same as what happened in Venezuela. It's exactly the same. Yeah? And I'm not talking of politics now. I'm just talking of realities. I mean, I don't give a damn about politics. I hate it. But, but this is what happened in the country. And apart from that, production dropped severely because no one could, the farmers were losing their land so they weren't producing. The peasants that had taken over or the workmen that had taken over the land had no interest in producing really so they used to just keep the food for themselves and had a, had a, have a hell of a good time in that period of three years. So Chile, we ran out of food, there were shortages of food, everything was a mess. Just think what life is like when you used to get up in the morning, you had no soap to start off with, you had no toothpaste to wash your thing, and you had no toilet paper. So you, they started off quite comfortable. That, that what was happening in Chile, basically. Yeah? There was no supply of anything. There's a black market for a lot of things at a terrific rate. Well, this is what happened in 1973. Farming stopped. Then in 1973, on the 11th of October, we are on the brink of civil war, basically because of the haves and the have-nots and whatever you want to call it, we're all there. And that is where the military came in and they said, okay, stop it. And this is where Augusto Pinochet came in and he did what he had to do and got the set, but he said, look, get the country back into production again. So now I'm talking on the farming side of things. What, what happened there? What did he do? He said, look, we must start feeding and, and not importing stuff. So he said, okay, what do we do? And now I come back to this farm here. This farm here, all the hills that are surrounding here, 600 hectares there, 400 hectares of flat land were in the hands of one owner. He was in his house, is around the corner over there. You just can't see it here, but he lived in that house. He was, he was a lawyer by profession, lived in Santiago. He lost his house, he lost everything, and they said, get the hell out of your house. So he went up to Santiago and the farm workers took over the house Five families went to live in it. They started chopping up the firewood and to the, they started pulling up the floorboards to firewood and blah, blah, blah. I love what happened there, but there was no production. So what happened there? Let me just get, uh, okay, try a drawing. So, so basically this thing, this land was expropriated and the work people were living in the houses there. 
the dairy cows would be eaten every day for an asado, for a, a barbecue there. They'd, when they needed meat, they'd go out and slaughter a, one of the dairy cows, and, and but no production. So uh, the, the military government came along and they said, oh, look, we must get this country back into line again. So what do we do? Farming. Okay, we will get the work people back onto land. Okay, so this was a big property. And they said, okay, the work people, we say 20 work people, families there. Okay, let's carve this, this thing up into, into plots of land and get the people to be owners of land. The original owner came running along and said, hey, hey, hang on, stop. You guys are handing over land that was exploded from me without any compensation. So the government, the military government, they say, okay, they thought about that and said, okay, we'll do this. We'll cow out 40 hectares of land and that's a take it or leave it. You either take that and you sign away the rest or you lose everything. When the military's in charge, you've got a bullet in front of you, and you say, yes, I'll take it. So well, <laughs> most farmers took it and he signed away the rest. So the owner of that house there, he said, okay, I'll sign it away, but get the people out of my house, what's left of the house, which was really badly damaged. So the military said, okay. And what they did is the rest of the farm he chopped up into plots of land, yeah? small land, which was in between 10 and 20 hectares of land in this area here. And on a per point <coughs> basis, they assigned it back to the, to the, to the, the work people. Yeah? So, okay, that's fine. And they were fine. So these guys, what happened here? The original farm owner got back his piece of land and he did what he wanted with it. And these guys got these pieces of land and the government said, Okay, go to it. Chile was totally destroyed, so we were open to the markets. We were free trade there. There was nothing to lose, so you could do what you wanted. If you wanted to plant, if you wanted to crop it, you wanted to cash crop it, if you wanted cows, whatever, you could do what you wanted. You could export if you wanted, you could sell here in Chile because it was free. At that time also, as we had no food, we were left high and dry <coughs> against competition outside. There were no tariffs, no barriers to bring in anything. So I, if I wanted food, I could also bring the food in from outside. So basically what happened is that the, the marketplace said to me, out there, survive. And that's fine. It's brutal. But if you want to survive, that's it. And that's what you guys are being trained for, I understand, to survive. So that's what happened in farming throughout Chile. We, had to, we were totally destroyed and we could only build from there and we had to go out and compete on the free trade outside. And that's what we all did. So this is the story of 1973 to 1980, more or less. That, that's a period there. Huge unrests, a lot of upheavals, but we're getting back into line again, and Chile came along. By that time, 1974, I had finished my studies, and I was working in New Zealand in a bank in those days, and I'd come back and forth to Chile quite a few times to see um, if I was offered a job in 1972. And as soon as I sat down on my desk, the first thing that came along, I said, okay, sign the paper here, you belong to this political party. I said, don't get stuffed, I'm not gonna sign any party to anybody. <laughs> and I got fired. So that was it, so I went back to New Zealand again. And that's what happened. In 1974, I decided, okay, I took my, my I decided, okay, I want to live in Chile. I was having a very good time in New Zealand. I imagine the only reason why I didn't stay in New Zealand is I didn't meet the right person to marry. Because had I married, had I been going out with a New Zealand girl, I probably would have stayed there. Uh, there was nothing to come back to Chile, except my parents were here, and we are, we're five brothers and sisters, but the other four had already all left Chile. One had been expropriated and had to go in Argentine, and the other three, had gone off to Canada and they were living in Canada. So my parents were getting old in those days, lived alone and were alone in a house in Santiago. I came back and I had, didn't have a bean in my pocket, but I started managing farms. And in 1980, I had the opportunity of buying my first piece of land. And why have I given you this long story? Because I wanted to show you how the fruit farming industry started off in Chile. Chile suddenly realized we had the opportunities of being good conditions for growing fruit. In fact, top conditions in the world. I'd say in the Southern Hemisphere, 
We are the most advantageous countries to grow fruit. We beat South Africa, we can beat Argentine, we beat New Zealand, we beat Australia. So we really we can do very well. And as we're off season with okay, you guys, we can start exporting fruit up to you guys. And that's how it all started off. So I came back after ha having studied sheep and cattle farming in New Zealand and suddenly bought a piece of land and decided, hell, I have to study fruit now. So that's what I did. And I managed farms, I saved up money. And this is the interesting part. I came along and I suddenly realized that these guys started selling their pieces of land. And it was small, relatively small pieces of land. So there I was able to buy one piece, then another one, blum, 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 and I put together this farm, which is basically seven, seven lots. Seven lots plus the other one around the corner there. But seven, I put together seven lots. And my wife helped me, the kids came along, and my work people helped me, and we've just got this whole thing up and planted. But I remember the first time, I showed you, you can see them over there, the first tree I planted, I had a textbook in my hand and with my mother. I dug a hole and we laughed like hell and we said, okay, we put the tree inside there, covered it up, and then we laughed even more. We had to prune the damn cherry tree. How do you prune it? And we, you know, I knew nothing about farming, but uh, fruit farming, but it was good fun. And that's how we started off this thing. So here is how Chile went the whole cycle, and that's why I've given you a, lot, a bit of the history here. So that you see how the fruit farming industry in Chile <coughs> took this huge leap forward because we had very good growing conditions. We were totally destroyed as far as our economy was going and you could only go forward and up. And it was all on the export market because they gave us a fixed dollar. They told us exactly how much our dollar was going to be. They kept that fixed for a number of years and they said, go to it. And we went to it. And that's what we're doing now.